Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Vanjush Komini, as uh, George has already presented me. And I'm going to talk about uh, uncertainty and why we actually need it in uh, deep learning. Uh, we're going to go through very, uh, the, the presentation is going to be rather short, and I'm going to have to speak firstly about uncertainty and uh, parameterization and how can we have a roadmap for deep learning. Uh, uh, why we actually bothering with uncertainty is that um, when we are doing uh, machine learning, we are uh, we are making assumptions which are necessary to to learn something. And without assumption, we cannot actually learn anything, as we have to carry the data anytime we have to make it. And we have to make a decision, and the assumption has to be about both data and the models. And sometimes either of them or both of them are are not correctly. Uh, taken, such as um, if we are assuming that the data generative model has uh, some kind of a mechanism, we are having a wrong number of hypotheses about their generative uh, domain. And sometimes uh, the type of hypothesis about the generation of the data, it's not right. And more than often, I would say that the data are not identically uh, independently distributed. And this is important because when you are fading the data sequentially, you are assuming that uh, you don't lose any information. But if they are not uh, independent from one another, you have to fed them into like a batch of data that are dependent to one another in order not to lose any information. Another thing that goes uh, without, uh, without noticing is that uh, when, you are losing, when you are using, for instance, L2 function, what you are doing is that you are intrinsically assuming that uh, the distribution of a uh, error it's Gaussian with the unit variance, but that's something that you really don't know if that's the case because the distribution of error could be any kind of a any kind of parametric or non-parametric distribution. And uh, using models, we're not estimating the joint distribution of the training data. And uh, in deep learning, uh, uh, we see that at the end, especially in uh, discriminating uh, discriminative models, uh, we are only uh, we are only having how whether this particular item be belongs to one class or another, and uh, uh, having just a single output at the at the end, uh, it's not um, it's not uh, enough information, and that means that if you want to answer, uh, estimate uncertainty, you cannot collapse. Uh, both having uh, the classification as well as its uncertainty in a single uh, integer, because uh, that will uh, that will uh, that will be um, a compression. And uh, I would say the last uh, five or six years there have been uh, very ser serious efforts in estimating the uncertainty. And uh, what you can actually achieve with it is that. Um, if you if you are trying to uh, classify uh, like uh, this uh, famous synthetic data set of uh, two months using the traditional um, uh, like machine learning deep learning methods uh, in uh, in the orange or yellow case you have the the confidence of your prediction and on the blue case you have the how much uncertain are you the bluer you, you are the more uncertain you are and if you can, as you can as you can see you are really confident on the areas that you really don't have any training data that, that is here. But by using the uncertainty, uh, a recent group um, was able to, to, to shrink this uh, confidence down to the, to the borders of the training data and have a pretty much uh, uncertain, uh, uh, uncertain predictive score in any, anywhere that is far from the training data. And uh, why is this important? It, that is important, especially when you have a training uh, test data that comes, uh, which is the red case here. And the, this come from a distribution that uh, they were never part of your training data. And in that case, your predictive model should say, hey, I never seen this. And the way to express this by having a very, a very high, uh, and very high uh, uncertainty, uh, uncertainty, which uh, is, uh, it's uh, modeled by probability distribution. Another uh, equally important, I would say, uh, or more important, it's uh, especially in healthcare, it's uh, how to do active learning. And why it's important is that um, if you have uh, cases when you have to do the segmentation of your heart uh, uh, 
chambers and uh, from ultrasound images, which I'm a bit uh, familiar with. Uh, you have to have a really trained doctor, doctors to really define the borders of your, of your heart walls. And um, that is an expensive, uh, very, uh, as well as a very uh, uh, not ob objective uh, estimation. And what you you're gonna do with it is that uh, you have to start with a simple training and then you estimate the uncertainty for the, uh, the, the, for the un a pool of data sets which are not labeled. And then you collect only those uh, data sets from the test pool that have a maximum uncertainty on prediction. And then you send this to the expert to label them. And you go through the loop again, again, until your, your test error converges. And this way you can uh, really guide your, your labeling process towards the most in informative uh, uh, data set. Another important uh, 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 task is uh, continual learning for non-IAD data set. And this is important, especially in the industry where the product are into an evolutionary uh, trajectory where if you are a startup and you start with a small data set, you really have to make sure that as you collect data and you keep on training, your method doesn't do any catastrophic forgetting because if the data set are from a different distribution, you are overriding the, the, uh, the weights and the, uh, the biases of a neural network and it will automatically forget what has been trained on the past. But by using uncertainty, you can, um, you can uh, have a better results even though you feed the data sequentially into your training process. Uh, another, uh, another important uh, parameter for, uh, for, the, for the deep learning is that the, the predictive output at the end should be calibrated. And what do I mean by that is that the, the, the classification score at the end should really reflect the, 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 the percentage of uh, that particular class in the training data. And if it, is, if it is higher than it should be, then the method is uh, are very confident, it's very confident and is over calibrated. And if it is below, the method is under calibrated. Uh, the first uh, uh, state of the art paper that uh, came out uh, at, uh, at NIPS, if I'm not wrong, uh, they were able to do to see that uh, traditional uh, machine learning were very much prone to overfitting and. Uh, Apart from dropout, which was uh, quite a popular, it's still quite a popular method, uh, the other uh, regularization methods were not able to provide a, a significant amount of uh, uh, improvement in generalization. And what was also obvious is that, uh, in, especially in, um, in regression cases, uh, the method was, was able to produce a very high confidence uh, prediction on regions that they never seen training data before. And the reason for that is because um, uh, the networks were single, um, and the network weights were single integers instead of, uh, uh, instead of a distribution. And uh, the author pr proposed that, okay, we don't have to have a single integer for parameters of the network, but we can instead have um, we can instead have a parametric distribution that defines the range of uh, the most likely parameters uh, for a particular network. And what it means is that um, by having a, by coming up with some uh, suitable distribution, and it is possible to have um, a distribution over weights by having just one more parameter because before we had just an integer, but now we have, uh, if we are using Gaussian, we have a mean and the variance for each parameter. By doubling the number of parameters, uh, uh, Blundell was able to estimate the uncertainty. So there was no need to go to like uh, very big uh, ensembles where the number of parameters will uh, skyrocket. But uh, as we probably are aware, of is that estimating the probability distribution, especially in neural network is not an easy task because uh, the complexity goes exponentially with the number of parameters. And one way around that it's by using variational inference. And what it means is that um, if I have a P, the actual distribution of weights given the data, 
what I'm uh, what I can do is that uh, I can instead come up with a different distribution that is more uh, it's parameterized by theta and it's easier to sample from in real time. Uh, it's it's sample it's uh, possible to sample in real time, and uh, uh, I can uh, have a KL divergence that tells me how far away am I from the actual distribution of the weights. And uh, the KL divergence is uh, it's uh, this simple integral of the log, but the problem here is that uh, okay I know what uh, what uh, uh, variational inference. Uh, a variational distribution is and how can I can parameterize it, but I don't really know what's the distribution of the weights given the data. And what I can do about that is that uh, I can instead use Bayes, Bayes theorem to get the distribution of the weights as the distribution of the data multiplied by the prior divided by the distribution of the data. And uh, the distribution of the data, it's something that doesn't depend on the parameter theta. Thus, we can instead discard it from the minimization process and we are left only with um, these uh, three different uh, probabilities. And what it looks like, this is a simple, uh, this part here, this integral, it's a, it's a single expectation. So the minimization process now becomes, uh, becomes a minimization on expectation where we are trying, where we're drawing samples from the variational distribution and then plugging them into my prior and the probability of my data given the, the parameters uh, and, uh, and the variational distribution. So the, the overall expectation could be broken down into like the likelihood of the variational parameter multiply with a log likelihood of the uh, divided uh, subtracted by the log likelihood of the data given the the network parameter minus some, the likelihood of the prior and this is something that has to be in a really educated guess so the minimization the problem now becomes a expectation minimization that you are drawing samples you are you are trying to estimate the expectancy of uh, this uh, term here, and then you are trying to minimize that with respect to the parameter theta. And the way you compute the expectation is by drawing Monte Carlo samples from the variational distribution and summing up all the likelihood that you get from the batch of samples. Uh, although they were able to get really good results on a regression, uh, on classification, the method was not, uh, he was performing uh, not significantly well, or let's say minimum improvement. And what, how, why you can say that is that on the left, you have the confidence map that comes from um, uh, applying Bayes backprop on, uh, on a synthetic data set that as it, as it is the two moons. But if you can say that uh, I have uh, some out of distribution data set sitting on the red, re on the red region, you don't really get a, uh, a very low confidence or a very high uncertainty, but it really depends where they are sitting. That means that the method is not suitable for predicting uh, uh, the confidence of, uh, of uh, your test data set very conveniently. Uh, if, I, if we go back to like 2020, because that paper is uh, from 2015, and uh, currently uh, there are, um, there are different uh, different uh, approaches to to like uh, regulate this, and uh, in the paper that came out in ICML 2020, uh, what they were doing is that um, at the very end they were getting rid of the they were getting rid of the soft max and replacing it with a radial basis function, and um, these are the feature uh, the omega c and uh, the the F theta is the it's a neural network that provides you the features of the of a test set, and uh, he was they were comparing it uh, with the center of a, of a of a batch of a, of a, of a training data, and if the the new test set was far away from the the center of the training set, then uh, the uncertainty estimation was defined by this distance. The further away you were the more uncertain the, 
the network was about this. And they are using the kernel trick to, to compute this distance as uh, uh, using the exponentiation will bring the data set to infinite dimensionality. And you can control the dimensionality of the data set using the, the sigma, which is a hyperparameter that has to be tuned on the, on the, on the test set. And this is uh, one of the downfalls or the limitation of the, met the method among some others. But uh, the result that they get on, uh, on estimating the accuracy, it's uh, close to perfect, I would say. The other method uh, that came at uh, NeurIPS uh, 2020, it's that uh, they were comparing, uh, they, they are replacing the last uh, Softmax layer with, uh, with the Gaussian process layer. And uh, as we know, the Gaussian processes are the state of the art at estimating the certainty. But uh, as we know, they are non-parametric methods. That means that uh, if you want to do a, a, a prediction of a test item, you really have to have your 20 data with you anytime you have to perform such an action. Otherwise, you cannot do anything with Gaussian processing without the data having them always there. And the other method that are uh, really, or they were really popular and still are, it's a deep ensemble. That means that you have a collection of different methods and then you try to average them out or do some kind of aggregation of the results. And the other method, it's, um, it's uh, MC dropout. That means that once you have trained your neural network on the test case, you don't have to keep the neural, neural network as it is, but you have to fed it multiple times by dropping randomly some of the parameter weights and the output from there can be computed as a uh, can will be aggregated and that will provide you a fair estimation of the variance and this method it's uh, the central one and the uh, the, the authors were able to produce uh, propose a, a deep neural network with the Gaussian processes at the end but they were at the beginning they were not able to get um, good results but they did some spectral normalization of the weights and uh, the, the performance was uh, was upgraded up to like a, uh, up to like a, as close as as you can get to the Gaussian processes. So these are the two state of the art uh, papers that I've seen so far. But uh, what they are actually doing essentially is that they are trading a bit of memory for uncertainty estimation. That means that um, they don't when they have a test item, you really have to have not all your training data, but part of your training data with you to compare it with the test data. And once you have them, you can have a fair estimation of uncertainty. And uh, my, uh, I'm also uh, trying to research this area. And uh, uh, currently I'm doing, uh, I'm, I'm uh, struggling with uh, two things in, in parallel or sequentially, I would say. At the beginning, I'm thinking, how can we do the, uh, the differently the reparameterization? And what I mean by that is that um, when you are doing uh, 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 uncertainty estimation in, uh, in deep learning, you are using gradient descent necessarily. And what do I mean by that is that if you have a random a variable somewhere in the computational graph, it's a random variable is drawn, it's, a, it's output is drawn uh, stochastically and it's fed further into further away into the computational graph. But you, when you have to have go backwards to fix the parameter weights, you have to have a network that is, um, that is uh, deterministically. That means that the stochasticity has to be moved away into some auxiliary variable. And uh, that means that uh, the, the network Z could instead be computed deterministically using the random variable. And that will allow us to compute the gradients. And the gradients now are computed using Monte Carlo, but not sampling from the from the primary variable uh, from the primary primary node anymore, but by sampling from a, a auxiliary node that is outside the the computational graph and is not parameterized. So its parameter really don't influence the the network weights, but uh, its values they facilitate the estimation of the gradients. And uh, I, I think uh, this is uh, not an easy concept, at least it was not easy for me to understand, but uh, 
what I, I found a figure from uh, Shakir Mohammed, which is a deep learning researcher. And uh, he, the way he was explaining is that, uh, imagine that you have a, a pipe and you have like mu and uh, R, which are like, a, they to parameterize a, a Gaussian distribution. And you are trying to draw samples from a Gaussian distribution and you don't know how to do it. But what you can do is uh, you can instead use some uh, uh, the, par the auxiliary distribution P of epsilon, which is a distribution that is super easy for you to draw samples from. And once you draw the samples from here, which are drawn stochastically, and the other parameters are, are fixed, what you get as an in output, you get uh, stochastic values as if they were drawn from the Gaussian distribution. And uh, why is that important? Is that uh, when you are using, um, when you are drawing samples to compute uh, the derivative of a function z, uh, the, 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 where you're drawing samples from, it's, uh, it's uh, driven by the parameter theta that you are trying to derivate from, as it is the integral here. But what we can say is that a continuous random variable can be drawn in different way, as we saw with a simple uh, analogy above, as far as the domain remain intact. That means that the continuous random variable can be reparameterized with a given function g and the, uh, and the epsilons are drawn stochastically, but the variables z are, are acquired deterministically. And uh, the computation of the, of the gradient now can be, can be reformulated using the p of epsilon. That means that uh, we don't have to compute, we don't have to draw samples anymore from P of Z, but we can draw them from P of Epsilon here. And the expectation becomes as, as here. That means that the gradient, the derivative, it's not, uh, the, the P of Epsilon is not depending on theta anymore. That means that uh, you can put this inside the, inside the expectation term. And why is that important? Is because you don't have to compute the expectation before you do the derivative, but you can flip these operations in, uh, and that means that you can compute the der derivative and then you compute the expectation. That means that uh, the parameter theta, it's really, it's really, um, it's really optimizing the reparameterization function G as well as the computational graph. And uh, if you want to look for like different ex, uh, reparameterization, it really depends on what kind of like distribution or you are using. But uh, what is uh, important to keep in mind is that the transformation should uh, ensure a preservation of the differentiable probability mass. And what do I mean by that is that um, the, once you have a, a change of variable of a, ran of a random variable, you should make sure that uh, its distribution integrate to one. And what do I mean by that is that if I have a change of a, of a random variable likelihood, if it is like shrinking, if it is expanding in domain, in order to keep the, the probability mass, which is the surface, the area under the curve here, it should be pushed down. And um, you can express this uh, in terms of equation as it is, where uh, this one will keep the rate of change. And the probability mass here conservation is expressed by this formula here that the p of the likelihood of z multiplied with a, the, the the range of uh, values should be constant irrespectively of what kind of distribution you are using. And why is that important? It's because uh, if I express a p of epsilon as uh, as uh, my uh, reparameterization function, but not as the forward, but as the inverse of it. That means that uh, I can express my, uh, the likelihood of the data using the, the inverse of my reparameterization function multiplied by the magnitude of the, its derivative. And this is important because that was the only term that ensures that the integration goes up to one and not less, not more. But the question that I was asking uh, why can't we use a neural network to do the reparameterization of the random variables instead of uh, staying just to simple Gaussian or Laplacian or any other 
distribution. And uh, this is what I'm investigating at the moment. And um, by using a neural network is that uh, you are going from a simple, re uh, from a simple uh, reparameterization to a normalizing flow. And what do I mean by that is that uh, you can reach any kind of unknown distribution of your training data as starting from a simple base distribution that you know very well, which could be like a Gaussian in our terms. As far as the neural network, it really has the capacity to map the data from one another. And this is one of the figure that I got uh, uh, from a paper in in, which is very recent. What they are doing is that uh, they are uh, they are having a Turing distribution and they are trying to match in, into like two multimodules, and uh, the trajectories are they really don't intersect with one another, which is, is one of the condition of normalizing flow. And then you can go from uh, from two from a bimodal distribution to the two rings and and back uh, by just inverting the normal the neural network here which is very simple. But um, uh, this is uh, rather simple when you have like a small amount of dimensionality of the data, but it becomes really complicated where the dimensionality of the data, it's very high. And why is that? That is because when you have to compute the determinant of, an, of a Jacobian, because uh, this derivative here in terms of a multi-dimensional distribution becomes a Jacobian. And the determinant is not uh, something that you compute in a lin linear term, but it, it is on the, on the third order. And uh, uh, the traditional way of doing that is by using a so-called coupling layer. That means that um, if I have my original distribution X, I split them into like two parts. And uh, I, uh, the one part remains unchanged and the other part, it's going to be changed. And the way it's going to be changed is uh, using uh, this equation here. That means that uh, you get uh, the, the change one and you multiply with a S, a T and S are two neural network. And this is exponentiation. And this is a changing part of the, of the training data. And on the next round, identical and change will flip will be flipped so you can uh, you ensure that you can change the in entire uh, dimensionality of the data but you do that sequentially of course this is a suboptimal but it works and the whole reason why we do this is because the determinant now or the log determinant of my jacobian could be computed in linear term by uh, using the by just uh, summing up the product coming up from the s matrix this one here and uh, in normalizing flow, you have the scale and the shift neural network and the final layer, which is the, a fine layer that sums up with, with all things together, could be either, uh, could, be, could, be, uh, could be put into like a, a sequence of, a, of a, could be replicated as many times as, as we want, uh, as far as the capacity of, of the neural network um, is met. And uh, this is called the normalizing because uh, uh, the density uh, of the of uh, the distribution it's uh, it's uh, is normalized using the invertible transformation, and it is a flow because uh, you can go from the base distribution to the target distribution and back, so the data will flow back and forth as far as you use the invertible or the forward transformation. And what is important, once again, is that the determinant of Jacobian should be in low complexity. Otherwise, this method is not scalable. And the input and the output uh, data, that means that the base and the target distribution should have identical dimensionality. And uh, what we are, as we stand now, uh, I'm trying to modify the, uh, the Bayes back probe by not using uh, a simple variational distribution Q of uh, omega and theta and estimating the uncertainty of the expectation like this, but I'm trying to use a normalizing flow for that. And uh, the way I'm, the reason why I'm doing this is that um, when you use 
um, a variational distribution, you have to come up with a very simple one. That means it's, a, let's say, a Gaussian. And you are having a very strong assumption about the, the distribution of the data set. And you are saying, my data set is Gaussian and I'm looking just for the mean and the variance. That fully it's sufficient statistic to characterize a Gaussian. But I'm trying to see what kind of improvement I have with the normalizing flow and see and see if we can do something more about it. And um, I'm currently running my experiments, but I don't have, unfortunately, any data set, any uh, experiment, uh, successful cases to show to you right now. And uh, the next thing is that um, I'm, uh, I'm trying to uh, like uh, think how can we make uh, a deep learning uh, equipped with a roadmap. And what do I mean by that is that um, if I have my training data here, and I, I have my data here, it could be training or testing, it doesn't matter. And I have my CNN, and I have my softmax layer. But uh, with a softmax, what I'm doing is that I'm computing the probability of uh, a given class given the data. But I'm not uh, entirely sure whether this is sufficient to say whether my data set is legit to be classified. And uh, for that, I'm trying to use a normalizing flow that estimates the likelihood of the data. And that means that uh, if I want to have a map of it, I can just plot the likelihood within the domain of the, of the data and see where the most likely items are and the, less like, the least likely items are. And what do I mean by least likely? It's something that I've never seen before and something that I've seen before. And that means that uh, instead of maximizing just the P of Y given X, that means that uh, during the training set, I just want to be able to classify correctly with high probability the class, the given class, the class I'm looking for given the data. I want to also maximize the probability of my training data and make sure that uh, whenever I have a data that is similar to my training data, I get a really high likelihood that tells me I've seen this before, you can classify it. Otherwise, the P of X should be very low that tells me, okay, never seen this in the classification, in the training uh, section. So this would have a very low likelihood. And then when you multiply this together, you should have a probability of, or the joint probability of a given class or given the data, and they both have to have high likelihood to have the classification legit. And uh, 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 this is so some like uh, of the results that I was showing before. In case I have my, uh, my training data, which is the two moons, and I start with the base distribution, which is a Gaussian. And this is not necessarily important as far as your neural network has high capacity to map to one another. As the training process go, uh, you, can, uh, you can estimate the the uncertainty of the data correctly. That means that uh, this will be the roadmap for my training, for my, uh, uh, from the test case. And that really tells me where the training data that you've seen before are. And in case I have a training data somewhere here, the likelihood here is very low. And when I'm, even though I have a very predictive P of Y given X, the likelihood will tell me you are classifying somewhere that you've never been before. Maybe you should be a bit more cautious. And uh, this is important, especially when I was trying to use um, Bayes backprobe in the two moon example, because uh, even though I was having a very clean um, classification boundary in here, as you can see that um, the confidence was very high, even in regions that, um, that uh, the uh, even in regions where there were not a single training set and uh, using this um, likelihood uh, map, I'm trying to rectify this. And uh, what do I mean by that is that I should have them both at the same time. And the, the, the likelihood function will be like a roadmap to tell me, you can classify in these regions because you have some, you have seen some training data and you cannot classify here because I never been in that region before. And um, this is um, 
Uh, this is the last slide, and I, I would like to thank you for your time. And I hope I didn't bother you with a lot of math, but uh, I'm happy to get any questions. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Vantus. Uh It was an interesting presentation. Uh, do you have any questions? Uh, yeah, I think I have one question. Uh, it's uh, the last sli slide when you were you when you were able to to uh, to tell your model able to tell the confidence of your prediction if it's uh, if you're sure about it you have seen the training data or not. Uh, you said um, this uncertainty can tell you uh, if you should be careful about your prediction or not, right? But um, uh, my question is, uh, do you think I can, uh, there, is there any action I can do during the learning or uh, during the prediction uh, with my testing data if it turned out I'm not confident enough? Uh, yeah. So if I understand correctly, the question is that uh, during the test case, yeah, that's the case. It turned out I'm not confident about my predictions, so um, and I need to be more careful. But uh, do you suggest uh, any action that time? <clears throat> I mean, what do you mean by being careful? <clears throat> Should you really predict? Because the neural network, they are not able to say I don't know. They only give you. Oh, they always give you an answer. That means a p of y given x, right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And by having this, they should be able to say. I don't know. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. It should tell you the likelihood of your of uh, of your data, and it's uh, in that case uh, it should be low enough. That means you're not confident about your prediction, right? Yes. So the green one and the black one, it's like low likelihood. That means I never seen it before this region. Ah, uh -huh, but uh... because this could be like the embeddings of your training data that comes from a CNN. Okay, but what perhaps I, I, I didn't make my question clear. I mean, one action I could think of uh, when I have such scenario, maybe active learning. So I get to have more labels from expert and I get to feed my model and then I become more confident over time, right? Yeah, I mean, that's one way if you can do that, but that's not always possible, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, sure. That's why I was asking maybe if there are other actions you would suggest in such scenario other than active learning. Ah, okay. So how to, uh, well, yeah, active learning is one. Mm -hmm. The other thing, uh, okay, now, mm -hmm. um, I mean, if it is some kind of like a, within the domain, then uh, it's fine. You can try to do active learning, but if you are trying to say like, uh, if you, if you if you still like uh, produce if you still use active learning and you still don't have sufficient data to make this uh, region here a bit more like uh, familiar, then uh, the active learning is still not going to be sufficient because you really need a lot of training data to generalize over this region here. Yeah, yeah. Also, I I could think uh, maybe uh, transferring some some knowledge from different or similar domain enough, so you would maximize your likelihood. But let's work around a bit. Yeah, I mean, transfer learning could be, but uh, still, you really have to have the uncertainty. Otherwise, you're going to run into like catastrophic forgetting there. Because if you have like a completely different type of distribution, and then you start training from there, and if you don't incorporate your uncertainty, the method is going to forget what has been trained before. If you don't do it like all at the same time. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Uh, okay, that's my question. Thank you, Vankush. It was a very interesting presentation. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Do we have any uh, more questions? I have a question. Uh, uh, first of all, yeah, thank you for the presentation. And like about these slides, uh, this slide uh, where you have uh, like this uh, uh, P of X, uh, which uh, represents basically, uh, from what I understood, like the confidence uh, that you have, like about the prediction of your, uh, like, uh, if you do a prediction, like if you are inside the white region, you are confident that it's uh, uh, okay because, like, you trained, uh, you have some training data in that region, and instead outside this region, it is black because you don't have any, uh, like, prior knowledge. 
but like I see that these regions are really like a sort of black and white, like there is like no gray area in, in the middle, which means that basically uh, like doesn't it like uh, kill a little bit the purpose of, of machine learning because the purpose of, of machine learning is to generalize uh, from outside the, the training data. Instead of here, basically, uh, whenever you have seen a training sample, you say, okay, I'm super sure that my prediction is correct. But whenever you're outside, you just give like a, a, a black. So you say, I'm not confident at all. Like, is it like what, uh, what this represents? Um, I would say, Yes and no. So this uh, data here is a generalization of your training data, and and uh, I'm making it this simple synthetic data because that is easier to like um, emphasize. But the, what is showing here is not the actual training data, but this is just a neural network able to reproduce the region that you have seen in training data. And uh, of course, this is black and white, but uh, this has just happened that. Uh, uh, there is uh, like a gap, a pronounced gap between the training data between two classes here. If the gap was a bit like a bit more like narrow, there would have been a bit gray area here. That will, uh, uh, because um, what you are doing here, you are just, uh, you have high density of points here and that's where you are putting low, uh, like uh, high likelihood. And uh, once you have this, uh, you don't, you don't have to keep your training data anymore with you to compare it with, but you just uh, produce um, you just produce uh, the likelihood uh, map um, from the uh, from the previous training data. And uh, unlike the previous cases where they were using Gaussian processes, is that uh, if I have a test data, I really have to have a, a good part of my training data to compare it with. But uh, if you can produce a likelihood instead of uh, of keeping all the training data that is possible. I think that is possible. And um, this doesn't uh, defy the purpose of, uh, of uh, I think, of uh, machine learning because uh, you're, you are not, uh, you are still generalizing uh, the training data over uh, with a likelihood. You are not uh, memorizing anything. You are just generalizing uh, how the training data looks like. And um, if I go back to my first example is that, uh, uh, you don't uh, you don't do computation of the normalizing flow on a data set be directly because uh, you don't know what the embedding looks like and the embedding should be suitable not just for your normalizing flow but also for the computation of the for the classification and uh, if you have uh, embeddings that really are far apart from each other and that is something that is ensured by backpropagating through this part. But uh, by backpropagating through this part, you try to generalize the embedding of their training data. That say, I don't I really suppress the dimensionality of the data, and still I group them. Uh, so the CNN here will suppress the dimensionality, and the softmax layer will put the similar items together and the dissimilar items far apart, and. Uh, the normalizing flow will try to like keep a picture of uh, this uh, re uh, aggregation of the data. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I understood uh, that. I think, but uh, uh, like my po my point was that like these uh, regions are sort of very tight, like uh, in a sense that uh, um, I expect that uh, if uh, like uh, a sample. Uh, like, like I, I agree that they generalize well the the training uh, uh, the, the distribution of the training data, but personally I expect that if uh, a sample falls like a little bit outside the the shape of uh, of the training data, you still have a little bit of confidence, like ju just intuitively. Like uh, uh, of course uh, you can't say in advance, but like uh, sh shouldn't like these regions be a little bit more like shaded or something like uh, uh, basically the, the, the farther you go from from your training data the the more they become black uh, sort of yeah i mean i think could be the case because if you look at i mean this is not uh, the typical data set to validate your question i'm sorry about that yeah yeah sure sure but uh, what i think here sorry cuz my email opens up uh, what i th uh, what i think here is that uh, 
if you can see some part of it, it's a bit shady, I would say, as you go further away. Do you see my mouse? Yeah, 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 I see, I see. But uh, I think what's the problem with the normalizing flow is that uh, to go from unimodal to multimodal is not easy thing. I mean, because here I'm starting from a Gaussian and I'm going to bimodal, right? But you can see here, there is a strip of a wrong uh, likelihood region here that tells me I've seen data here before, which I've never seen before data here. Uh, yeah, I was also wondering why, why, this, uh, why that artifact exists? Like... Yeah, because when you use the coupling layer, you, are, you're, you're, uh, you don't ensure that there exists always a neural network that can map the data from, from, from one base distribution to another because this the coupling layer makes the the coupling layer here makes the the problem sub optimal uh, this one here yes yeah, so, so basically it's limited uh, by the structure of the neural network basically by the model of the neural network by the model of the neural network and by the base distribution that you're come that you come up with but oh, okay. uh, in, in this case that we know that we are looking for two type of classes, you can come up with a base distribution that is, that is bimodal. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah I, I understand. It's way Thank more you. when you don't know the classes, so. Okay. But, but so sh should, you, should you in general, if you don't know anything, should you start with uh, a more complex distribution uh, so that, because it's easier to merge, uh, if, if you have in a starting distribution with a lot of uh, different clusters, it's easier to merge them for the neural network than to split them. So would you start with a complex multimodal distribution and then it can make it a unimodal distribution in the end if it needs to? Um, I think that could benefit, but I have never tried it. But uh, I was thinking, why do I have to add a complexity when I know that I'm looking only for two classes of data set? And if there are subclasses within those classes, they will be intrinsically like uh, sitting under the same umbrella of likelihood. Yeah, yeah, I was thinking if, if you don't know, I mean, in the case where you don't know a priori what you're looking for, but we are in a classification problem, so you must know what you're classifying in a sense. Okay. So. Yeah, in this case, it, it's not needed. If you don't have the classes, that's uh, difficult because um, normalizing flow, they don't really learn a semantic uh, representation of the data as, do, as you do in the classification case and really have to really change the fine coupling layer. But if you do the normalization all the way at the end of your, of your embeddings and you ensure that your embeddings are semantic representation rather than correlation between pixels, then you have some chances of doing a, a better uh, confidence estimation, I would say. Yeah, so this is the important bit. It's not like you're not working on the input data, you're working on the embedding that your neural network is learning. That is what you are trying to, yeah. to find the likelihood. Of likelihood. Yes. Okay, so I, I have one more question. Um, I remember some time ago, I saw some papers and I don't know how they did it, uh, that were uh, um, tackling the problem of uh, regression instead and putting some kind of boundaries on your regression. So like now I am uh, saying that this should be 7.5, but because this area, I didn't see it very often, I will tell you that it's maybe plus or minus three. So they were trying to put these kind of uh, intervals for regression. And so is this uh, somehow related to this? Would you be able to um, use a method similar to this for regression and for understanding how likely your regression is? Yeah, for regression, this is, uh, I would say a little bit easier because uh, you have a, uh, the dimensionality, uh, because you have like data points from one another that really bounders the, it's boundering the, because the distribution is sitting on top of the regression line. And you, if you're trying to pr pr predict the confidence uh, um, uh, boundaries uh, there, it's, if you have like data forward and backwards, the dimensionality, 
uh, the, the boundaries will be shrinked much more. I mean, these methods, they tend to be better on regression than classification intrinsically. Especially Bayes backdrop, it's, uh, it has been tested only on regression and that's where it's mostly used for like a state of the art, I would say, but not on classification. Okay, so this is the hard part of it, okay. Uh, but uh, for BS, uh, I'm sorry, for regression, um, you have a method called the Monte Carlo dropout. And uh, it's uh, this method here. And what you do there is that uh, if I have a neural network that I've, I've trained like uh, as I usually do, and uh, to estimate this boundary that you're talking about, I can feed the same, the same, uh, in, uh, the same input more than once. But what I could do is that I can switch on and off some of the parameters are on the test on the test phase uh, randomly or using Monte Carlo. And if I get uh, the, the output of the neural network, that will be a range of outputs. And there I can take this range of outputs and put it in the region of my classification. And that boundary will be better than uh, usual. And this is a Monte Carlo dropout that um, it's a paper from uh, from this guy, Yarning Gall. This, uh, that was another like um, quite popular method, I would say, on uh, self-driving cars and many others. I see, I see. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for these pointers. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for the question, Thomas and Ludovico. So uh, do we have any other questions? I think no. So thank you very much, Banjus, for the presentation and answering the questions. Uh, I will stop recording.